Welcome to our online service. We are so glad to have you with us. My name is Nathan and I'm the lead pastor here at Orange Baptist Church. We would love to keep blessing you and one of the key ways you can partner with us is by sharing and liking and subscribing to this channel uh, and sharing this content through a whole multitude of platforms uh, so that we might see other people blessed in the good news of Jesus. Another key way of partnering with us is that if you are blessed by this, that you might consider partnering with us financially here uh, at the work of Orange Baptist Church. And then one of the key ways to do that is through our online giving platform and the details for that are below in the description. We wanna be praying for you and we want you to connect with us. So if you need prayer at any point along the way, please shoot us an email at prayer at orangebaptistchurch.org.au and a team of people are waiting to pray with you and for you. And if you are ever in the local vicinity of Orange in New South Wales, please drop in, come and see us on a Sunday morning. We would love to worship with you and to celebrate Jesus together. Be blessed. Father in heaven, your name above all names, we praise you this day, for you are worthy of all of our praise. 
May you reign in each heart here today and watching online. Your kingdom extend through our hearts and minds, Lord. Your will, Lord God, we seek in this place and in each of us today. Lord, we need you for every breath we take and you provide all things we need for your will in our lives. Today, Lord, we pray for Shine and Jess and their family after suffering, suffering such loss. And Lord, we know that Jesus wept when he saw the pain of his friends at the loss of his friend Lazarus. And so we know that you, you feel the pain of Shine and Jessica and their family at the loss of their loved ones. Lord, we pray for those who are in anguish because of ill health or ill health of a loved one. Lord, would you bring healing in that place? Lord, where there is anger and offence, would you bring peace and contentment? Where there is joy, may you continue to bring joy. Lord, your word is sharper than a two-edged sword. And some of us might be feeling its sting as we travel through Romans. On one hand, we know that this is your absolute truth, your very words. And on the other hand, it's not always what we want to hear. Holy Spirit, by your great mercy and by your great power, move in us today so that today, when we hear your voice, our hearts will not be hardened. So we might lift up our eyes to you, Lord Jesus, and pray the words of Jeremy Camp. Purify this tainted soul. I'm tired of living life a fool. Soften up this heart of clay. To be your servant, I pray. A reflection of you, Lord, I long to be. So your kingdom I will seek. I surrender to your throne, and I will make your, my heart your home. I surrender to you, your throne, Lord Jesus. Amen. Uh, this morning we're reading from Romans chapter 11 and we're going to read the whole chapter together. So starting from verse 1 of chapter 11. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And David says, may their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you, Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, though a wild olive shoot, have been grafted in among the others and now sharing the nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to, the, to those other branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branch branches, he will not spare you either. Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, 
provided that you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will also be cut off. And if they do not persist and if they do, do not persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut cut out of an olive tree that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive tree, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers and sisters, so that you may, may not be conceited. Israel has experienced a hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion, he will turn godlessness away from Jacob, and this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake, but as far as election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs, for God's gift and, and his call are irrevocable. So just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to, has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. O oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable his judgments and, the, and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of God or who has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that he should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Lord, now as we come to your word, your holy word, Lord, through the power of your spirit, would you illuminate these words to us that we might understand them, that we might understand more of you, that we might experience more of you, that we might be humbled before you. And that in this humility that we might worship you fully. Lord, for many of us, we bring preconceived ideas to passages like this. Uh, help us to, to lay them down uh, and just to hear your word. Minister to us, Lord, and I pray that the words that I say would be right and pleasing in your sight and that you would deal graciously with us. We pray this in the powerful name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Romans 11 kind of finishes off this little chunk of Romans 9 to 11. Uh, all of Romans is this kind of book of, of richness, this deep, rich theology. There's no greater unpacking of the gospel than the book of Romans, in, in my personal opinion. And as we jump into Romans 9 to 11, we get these kind of challenging sections of Scripture, particularly around God's sovereignty. Uh, and, and while on the one hand we fully agree and, and settled in God's sovereignty, then when we start to unpack what that sovereignty means and what that looks like, sometimes we can kind of get our back up a little bit. And particularly when it comes to the understanding of salvation. And we, we struggle with this. We, we fully recognise that all of us are sinful and broken, that all of humanity is sinful and broken. And yet what we read in Romans in particular is that God in his mercy has mercy and compassion on those whom he chooses. We, we know in Ephesians that he chooses those according to his good purpose and will. This is the nature of God. And we jump in particular into in Romans 9 to 11 because there's this big fundamental question that keeps being asked. What about the people of God? Well, what about the people in which God had redeemed out of Egypt and has made them his people? But what about the promises that God had made to them? Now, in light of the gospel and the, the Israelites' rejection of the gospel, has God's word failed? And the answer is a resounding no, of course it hasn't. And we jump back into chapter 10 from last week and what we see is Paul's great heart that Israel would know the glory of Jesus and be submissive to him. That's his great desire. And so we jump into chapter 11 with that backdrop. We jump into chapter 11 and we see just the... Uh, the, the, per, the power and the purpose and the sovereignty of God yet again and how he operates. 
We jump into chapter 11 and we jump into verse 1 and Paul begins this chapter, as he has done on many of occasions, with a question. A rhetorical question in a sense because it was a letter being read and so really not many people had a chance to respond. Uh, but more than that, it was, a, it was a real question that is likely to come up out of all that he's been saying in the last few chapters. And the question is this. I ask then, did God reject his people? Did, did God reject Israel? And the answer is, by no means. Absolutely not. And how do we know this? Well, for a couple of reasons. What we've seen uh, already in Romans 9 in particular was that God is going to save a remnant from his people. That that while all of Israel had failed, God was going to restore and redeem a hold, a, a group from within the nation. And it's not just that this is a new kind of idea. Back in Romans 9, what we see is Paul quoting the book of Isaiah, where again God promises in light of his redemption that he would save a remnant of his people. Paul then says, no, God has not abandoned his people. He has not rejected his people, not by any stretch. He has promised that he will save a remnant of which Paul is one of them. Paul, this isn't just a theoretical understanding for Paul. This is his life, which is why he says, I'm an Israelite. I'm one of the remnants. I'm one of the ones who know the power of Jesus and his salvation. And yet I remain an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. What we have here is he's kind of trailing his whole history And Paul has kind of got a bit of a habit of doing so, but he's showing that he is Jewish, truly Jewish at every point along the way. And yet God has saved him just as he had promised. God hadn't rejected Israel. He's going to save this remnant. And to back this up, Paul moves just from his own experiences and takes us back to a couple of the stories from the past when all thought was lost, that there would be no more of Israel, that God's judgment would be severe and wipe them all out, and God doesn't. And the first one is the story from Elijah. It takes us all the way back into 1 Kings 19 in particular, uh, and this is how this goes. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left and they are trying to kill me. This is a moment which Elijah is running away because of all the, the, the nation of Israel had seemingly taken hold of and rejecting of God and started to worship Baal. And it was really like hell in a handbasket. And so Elijah then runs away. And he's now having a bit of a sook. And in this sook, he cries out to God and goes, Oh, Lord, all hope is lost. All hope is lost. I'm the only one. Ah, I'm all alone. Like it's this kind of, oh, I'll have his Shrek in my, in my vision now. But I can't imagine Elijah quite look like Shrek. But beyond that, he cries out to the Lord and says, I'm the only one left. I'm the only one left. To which God goes, back in your box. This is how God responds. He says, and what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. God had preserved 7,000 and had protected their hearts and they had not turned to Baal. Elijah thought he was the only one left. He could only see it from his perspective. He couldn't see outside of himself. And yet outside of himself was this sovereign God who had already determined to save a remnant of which he would then build upon in the restoration of worship to him. And so it is. It's this reminder, particularly to the Jewish community who were in the church at the time, God's not done yet. Just because you think you're alone. God is still in control and he's got a plan. And his plans are generally pretty good in the fact that, you know, he's God. 
it goes even further than that. Uh, and then he says at this time in, in verse 5, he unpacks this for us, that God has saved this remnant. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. God just didn't do it in the past. He's doing it now. And the remnant in which he has saved, he is saving because he has had mercy on whom he has mercy, compassion on whom he has compassion. His grace is a gift, an undeserved gift, and it has been bestowed upon a small group of people of which Paul is one of them. And it has to be grace because verse 6 says, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. It can't be based on what you do in pursuit of God. There is nothing that you can do in your own pursuit of God that can please God because in your pursuit of God, you are trying to play God. And if it isn't a gift of grace, then what is it? It's works. But it's not works because of God's grace and his grace is sufficient and he gives it according to his good pleasure and will. And that is the amazing nature of God's grace on us, not just the remnant here, but even for the Gentile community, those who did not know God, who did not grow up in the understandings of God and his law. And so then he says, what then in verse 7? What then? Were the people of Israel sought so earnestly they did not obtain? Well, the elect among them did, but the others were hardened. Here it is again, just like we saw in Romans 9. The moment in which God hardens hardened hearts. He takes what is already there and he just hardens it even further. So he saved this remnant and he's hardening those hearts just as that was, it was written. Again, we go back into 1 Kings and we go back into Isaiah. Is the quote here, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see and ears that could not hear to this very day. And again, it's this hard teaching that God is the one who has shut eyes. God is the one who has closed off ears. They, they, they already had this. There was already a nature, a part of their sin, and God ensures that. And then again, even further, we have a quote from Psalm 69 when David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see and their backs be bent forever. It's harsh in so many ways, isn't it? It's harsh that God, this sovereign God, it's it's hard teaching for us to kind of comprehend. And yet it's here for us and we have to not just acknowledge it and then internally disagree with it. We, We might struggle with it internally, but that doesn't change what is there. And so we have to end up bowing our knee to what the truth says. And here's the kicker. Truth... God's truth, while hard for us, it does create something within us. It does create a pursuit of God, or at least it should. And we'll see at the back end of chapter 11 where that deep contemplation of truth lands. But before we get there, um, there's this kind of fundamental question that seems to still be asked in the nature to God's sovereignty, particular over his people. And so in verse 11, we have this question. Again, I ask, here it is again, did they stumble as to fall beyond recovery? That is, have Israel stumbled so far from God? Have they walked so far from the glory of God in the face of Jesus that they cannot come back, that they are beyond rescuing, that they are so far beyond that that even God's reaches can't reach them? That's the question. And again, what's the answer? Not at all. In in fact, it shouted, not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, that is Israel's transgression, you need to stick with me here, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. 
Okay, so, so this is kind of how it looks. I'm going to make this really simple for you. So God has called Israel. Israel's rejection of the gospel has meant that the Gentiles would receive the gospel so that Israel itself would be envious and in their envy, the rest of the world would then see, they would come to God and that the rest of the world would see the envious nature of Israel and they're coming back to God and that they would too come back to God. Got it? Cool. Let's pray. I'm going to break this down. So God chooses Israel. Israel's rejection of the gospel has served its purpose so that that gospel message would reach the Gentiles. How does that work? Trail through the book of Acts. Every time the Apostle Paul goes into a new town, where does he go first? The synagogue. Every time. Every time he goes to the synagogue and he debates with them the fullness of the Scriptures. And what happens every time he does that? Paul, see you, pal. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. Except, randomly, there's always a few who hear this message of the gospel, even inside the synagogues, and go, oh, my gosh. This is what's been prophesied for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. This fully makes sense. And so they tot off with Paul. And Paul's now left going, well, they've rejected me at the synagogue. Where do I go next? Marketplaces and to individuals, of which what happens with the proclamation of the gospel to and in these places? An explosion. Hearts open, hearts set before God. People graze knees because they've been humbled before the Creator. They have walked from all of the gods and all of the pagan ways and have now come into pursuit of Jesus himself, liberated with freedom and hope and grace and mercy that is undeserved and they are just implored with it and it's overcome by it so that they themselves live now for the glory of God, right? But who's watching? The Israelites. And what do they see? This new people of God following the Messiah, living out the commands that they themselves had been given all the way back at the beginning, where you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, strength, soul and mind and love your neighbour as yourself. And now they're going, wait a minute, they're doing a better job than what we were. This is what it looks like to be in relationship with God. And so that some of them would then come back to the Messiah because they've been envious of what they have been missing out of yet had been promised. And as they come to faith, the rest of the world goes, how is that that you would put the Messiah to death and now humble yourself to come back into relationship with him? There must be something to this. And this has been God's plan. (laughs) It's like, you can't write a story that good. In a human way, you you could not write a series of books where you would choose a people who reject you to bless another group of people so that this group would be envious to come back to them so that the rest of this world would go, wow, we want him to. But that is the very purpose in which God does here. Here. And it's in here that we see and we find our humbled nature before him. I keep reading. But if the transgression means for the riches for the world and their loss means riches for the Gentiles, how much greater riches will there be in the full inclusion? I'm talking to you Gentiles. And now he kind of redirects his focus, now speaking to the, to the non-ethnic Jews of the community of faith. He says, I'm talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take my pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to envy and save some of them. So Paul's ministry is wholly and solely to the Gentiles, but in doing so, he is hoping that people would see and come to salvation, his own people. He says, he goes even further than this. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, so that is Israel's rejection of the gospel has now brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance but life from the dead? 
What would that look like? It would look amazing, wouldn't it? That all peoples and all tongues willingly confessing Jesus as Lord? Do you know how this plays out in reality? Look around. In this community of faith, we have people who have been taken hold of the gospel from 23 different nationalities. And we live in the whitest part of the world. And yet God's gospel has gone out. And in going out, we have become gathered here in this place for the worship of God as a full expression of all that has been promised. We live this life. We see unity in the gospel that goes beyond our ethnicity and our race because God is God and he has redeemed us to the very ends of the earth, including a remnant of Israel. We have people here who their ethnicity is traced back to an Israelite, saved by God's grace, worshipping the Messiah. Here, it's, look, this isn't theoretical. This isn't just a Bible study. This is our community. We have been swept up into this gospel. This is cause for celebration. God's word is true and we can all see it. Are you with me? But what does that mean for us? I love how Paul, uh, Paul says here in, uh, from verse 16, he says, uh, he says uh, if, part of the, if part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. Isn't that that beautiful? Isn't that rich? It's great, isn't it? It's just fantastic. It just just causes our hearts to to, to burst into life, doesn't it? For you, must be, surely. Because you know exactly what Paul's saying in that, don't you? Because if you do, can you tell me? (laughs) Oh, I got no idea. It's really funny. You look at all the commentaries, and every verse is like slabs of commentary. Verse 16 is like one line. <laughs> it's really hard. But but here's what I think it's saying. Uh, that that again, the, the, the remnant, if God pr- preserves a remnant as holy, then everything else that comes is going to be holy. Are you with me? And then in verse 17, he says, the in verse 17, he says. If some of the branches have been broken off and you, again to the Gentile, though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in its nourishing sap from the olive root, do not consider yourself to be superior to other branches. Caught hold of that? You will say then, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but tremble. There's this incredible warning to to those who have been grafted into the tree. That is those who are outside the Israelite um, world and ethnicity who have been swept up into the gospel and now find its root, now being attached to the root of all that God has done from the very beginning. And there's this deep warning here that says, don't you be arrogant in the gospel. Don't you think yourself better than everyone else, particularly God's chosen people from the Exodus. Don't think that somehow you are better. Somehow do not think that they are lost forever. Don't think that you are amazing, even though that the vast majority of God's church are made up of the rest of the world, the, 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 the Gentile community, if you will. No, no, don't, don't get arrogant, don't get conceited. Because remember, you're only in here by faith. And you're only in here by faith because I chose you. So be very careful. Remember who's in control. Remember who's God and humble yourself before me. Yeah? Apparently it looks a bit like this. I'm not a horticulturalist. Um, uh, Perhaps in my younger years I may have been. 
uh, but now I'm not a horticulturalist, and so I'm going to take it on the assumption that none of you are horticulturalists. Uh, and so in this, um, there is a, a, a red, at least, so I'm going to take it as fact, um, that I read that apparently what happens is in a cultivated olive tree, if it no longer bears fruit, that if you go and find a wild olive tree and take off a branch, if you then graft that into the original root, the tree springs to life again which is a beautiful analogy here of what's taking place. I don't know if it's true or not, but let's work with that, shall we? So if that's true, and any other horticulturalists out there, um, even online, I suppose you can email me. Um, you can email me at christy at orangebaptistchurch.org.au um, and uh, we'll get in touch with you there. <laughs> but but here, here's this nature in which you say, don't, don't, don't get arrogant. The branches were removed because of their unfaithfulness, because they did not walk with God. They did not walk with me, they rejected me, and so those branches were removed. And it wasn't so that it was just so that you could have room to be grafted in. This tree is far bigger than that. And in fact, further, what we'll see is that those branches that were removed, they too will be grafted back into the tree so that there will be one true spiritual Israel that will not be defined by ethnicity, but by faith in Christ Jesus. And that will be some tree to see. We've got to be careful that we don't become arrogant and conceited with the, with the message. And that looks like two things to me. One, that doesn't mean that we just kind of sit in this and go, yeah, I'm saved. It's a pretty special place to be. I'm just going to sit comfortably. Recognise what it has cost for us to be grafted in. Because there was another tree that was cut down. And it was made into a cross. And in Christ's death and through his resurrection, we have been saved. We have been lovingly cared for, taken cut into this root and wrapped up so that we would bear fruit. And what happens to those branches who bear no fruit? They are removed. It also means that we continue to pray for all people, including God's people, including those who have Jewish ethnicity. The mission of God continues to go out to them, as it does to all people groups. God is doing his work of salvation as he chooses. It goes even further here uh, in verse 22 to 24. Consider, therefore, the kindness and the sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you. And here's the clause provided that you continue in his kindness. There is a call here for us to persevere, that we don't sit arrogantly and conceited in the gospel and then no longer persevere in God. It's not that we've just prayed a prayer, we have our Willy Wonka golden ticket, we shove it in our pocket, we live as we please, so that we somehow, when we stand before Jesus and he says, why should I allow you to enter my rest? Because you go, because I've got my ticket. I prayed a prayer once, trumped Jesus. No. No, those who persevere, those who persistently continue to hold on to the glory of God. And this is the mark of the elect. Not that we've prayed a prayer, but that we persevere in him until our final breath. Are you with me? We can't just go, yeah, I'm a Christian, and then live as however we like. It is up until that moment in which God calls us home and in our last breath that we continue to say, Jesus is Lord, my God raised him from the dead. We can't just sit there and go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, Jesus is important, but, you know, i got other things to do too. But I prayed a prayer, so that's sweet, Right? No, that's cheap grace. It's not the gospel. That doesn't look upon our king and go, wow. 
No, that's just trying to bask in the benefits of God and not in God himself. We have to persevere in him. The greatest picture of this for me is, is my spiritual grandfather, Reg Wery. And for some of you, you've heard this. Bear with me. It's, it's, the, it's the most enduring image I've got of what it means to persevere right to the very end. This man who was in World War II and got captured and was a German POW, nasty kind of world in which he lived, he comes back to Australia and he can't help himself and you know, drinks himself near to death and gambles away everything he's got. Here's the gospel. Changes his life instantaneously. His first thing, he walks straight into a bar, stands up on the bar, screams out so the whole bar would stop and goes, just letting you all know, I have met my Jesus and I won't be coming here again. And they're all laughing at him and said, yeah, see you in a couple of days. He never walked back in. This is a man who just then dedicated his life to the pursuit of Jesus, just to know him more, to love him more, to experience him more. I could tell you about the various ministries that he's been a part of. I could tell you about the mission endeavours that he was. I can tell you that he and his brothers funded a Bible college. I can tell you all of these things, and all of them are true. But the most enduring image I have is two hours before he died. Where even after all these years, it still kills me. Where I sat with him by his bed as he was almost, he was almost fully unconscious. And I held his hand and I watched him breathe. And then in a moment, he became lucid and he opened his eyes and he looked at me and I looked at him and I said, Reg, are you ready? Are you ready? And he looked at me and goes, I can't wait to see my Jesus. That is perseverance. That is the marker of God's salvation. I watched that man in all of his years be locked up in his home, house ridden, praying day after day with a list, holding on to his second wife who was German, <laughs> holding her hands and praying for people nonstop. That's perseverance and that's what we're called to and that's what is missing for so many of us is this desire to pursue Jesus for Jesus' sake, for just his glory. For most of us, I think we just pursue Jesus more for his benefits. And in that, there's warning. Take heed of this warning. If they do not persist, or if they do persist in unbelief, they will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. After all, if you were cut out of an olive tree, that is wild by nature and contrary to nature were grafted into a cultivated olive, how much more readily will these, the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? This is God's redemption story. And one which we must take hold of. He then says, I don't want you to be ignorant. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. Brothers and sisters, so that you may not be conceited, Israel has experienced a hardening of heart in part until the full number of Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. There's a process here in which God is using, he's waiting for this number of whatever he's determined for the Gentiles to come in before he's, then he's going to do this work and he is doing this work in the people of Israel. And there's this hard thing here for us to interpret when, when Paul says, and all Israel will be saved. In our reading of that, we kind of think, oh, every kind of person who is uh, ethnically Jew is then going to come to salvation. That, that's not what this is. Uh, there's a couple of different ways of interpreting it, um, but the, the clearest way in Scripture is to see that um, just because, uh, just because uh, he talks about all Israel, that does not mean every individual. So he's talking about Israel as a whole, yeah, seen in the remnant in which he's been saved. There's countless times in the Old Testament that, that God talks about uh, all of Israel gathered at Mizpah. 
Well, not every single person in Israel gathered at that moment. It's a term talking about the whole. Here, there is a whole of Israel. That the, the very purpose of Israel will be saved and seen specifically in the remnant in which he's chosen. Does that make sense? Uh, and this is how this will play out. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will turn good, uh, good godlessness away from Jacob. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There's the promise. As far as the gospel is concerned, they are enemies for your sake. That is that they rejected God. They rejected the gospel. They did. And it served for us. But as far as the election is concerned, they are loved on account of the patriarchs. God has not abandoned his promises. He hasn't. He's not allowing them to just disappear. For God's gift and his call is irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may know now receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. And that's that circle again. You see it? For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that they may have mercy on he may have mercy on them all. It's a beautiful picture. These, these doctrines, these truths, I know they're hard, but they draw us further into God. And as we draw further into God, our hearts become softened to God and we, we become humbled before him and we relinquish our own kind of expectations and we just sit in the mysteries of God. And when we do that and we draw closer with him, do you know what springs forth? Do you know what springs forth? Or what, has, what should spring forth? Worship. Worship. As we sit with the mysteries of God and yet we, we receive and we experience his salvation and his mercy and his compassion. And as we sit with these hard teachings and we work through them and we struggle through them and we meditate on them, it moves our hearts closer to him in which we then are more mesmerised by his power and his sovereignty, which then causes our hearts to overflow in worship. Don't believe me? That's exactly what happens to Paul here in verse 33. After unpacking all of these rich doctrines, look at how he responds. Oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has never known the mind of the Lord or whoever has been his counsellor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay them? For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. That is the purpose of Romans 9 to 11. That is the purpose of all of Romans. That is the purpose of the entirety of the Scriptures, that we would see the glory of God, that we would take hold of him, that we would look upon him and go, who is your equal? Not me. Not me. I'm a speck of dust and yet you, you choose to redeem me. My gosh, what can I do? How unsearchable. I, don't, I can't understand why you do what you do. I can't make sense of it all. I can't work it out. And Because if I did, I would be God. And if I'm God, that means that you don't get the worship that you deserve. So God gives us our mystery, his mysteries so that we are baffled more by him. So that we are drawn into him. So that the praise of our hearts might be louder for him. Did you see this? Again, he quotes Isaiah. It's as if as in this moment of worship, just the scriptures are just coming to his mind because he studies them, right? Happens that way. And again, he calls out in Isaiah 40, and not just Isaiah, I think it's really interesting that he uses Job. He kind of cries out of this passage in Job after all of this pain. Again, this worship of God. And why? 
because everything we have is from him. Including the breath you just took. It's from him. By his grace. And it's been given to us through his son. And he is all things. To him, our God, our King, our Redeemer, our Lord, be glory forever. Amen. God is good. And his sovereignty is a place to rest. And it is a launching pad for our praise and worship. Let me pray. You are so good, O oh Lord. To think, Lord, that you have devised a plan to redeem all of humanity it is just an astounding thing to me. That you would use the brokenness and sinfulness and use it as a means by which you call those in which you have chosen to yourself. Lord, that you have swept us up, grafted us into your tree, into your salvation. Lord, I pray that you would stir in us, that it wouldn't just be knowledge, but it would be truth that moves us to a place of worship a place of surrender, a place of thankfulness, a place in which we would persevere in you, that you would bear fruit through us for the glory of your name. For from you, and through you and for you are all things. That means us too, Lord. To you be the glory forever. Amen.